read the first 13 verses of Acts chapter 2. If you've been with us in recent weeks, you know we're looking into these early chapters of the book of Acts. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That's as far as I'm going to read. Some years ago I went to a church in England where I was going to speak for a week beginning on Sunday, going right through the week, a sort of Bible conference. And I announced at the first service that I was going to speak that week on the person and work of the Holy Spirit, who he is and what he does. And at the end of that service, a man, one of the elders, came to me and said, you could not have picked the worst subject to speak on this week. I said, why is that? He said, we've had nothing but trouble from the Holy Spirit for the past three years in this church. Well, I understood what he was meaning, though he had an unfortunate way of saying it. What he meant was that there had been some controversy and some division, I suspect. And we know that in recent years, this has been an issue which has divided churches and divided Christians. Ironically, when the work of the Spirit is to unite the body together. But that has been the case. And the best antidote to confusion and division is not to avoid the subject, but to address it. And understand, what does the Bible teach in this very important area? And I'm going to take verse 4 this morning. In fact, I'm going to take half of it. I attempted in our first service to look at both parts of this verse and ran out of time, so we're just going to look at one part this morning. Verse 4 says, All of them, that is the 120 men and women who are waiting at the end of chapter 1 in Jerusalem for this event to take place, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And I'm going to divide this first into two parts. The second part we'll talk about next week. The first part is this, that the Spirit brings us into union with God. And that is what I want to talk to you about this morning. Let me explain what I mean by that. Now we talked last week about the fact that the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. And previous to this, these disciples and those with them had been servants of Jesus. Previous to this, they had been followers of Jesus. They had been friends of Jesus. They had been near to Christ. But they were not one with Christ. And now something wonderful happens, and it's this. The life of God came to inhabit their humanity. The actual life of God passed into their lives. And what happened at Pentecost was nothing less than that. In fact, nothing less than that is the essence of Christianity. The reason why Jesus died in order we might be forgiven of our sin is not simply that we might be clean, but that having cleansed us, the decks might be cleared so that now the Holy Spirit can come to live the life of Jesus in us and impart the life of God to us. I was reading just the other night, I think it was in Reader's Digest, one of these little anecdotes that they have in there about the Norwegian explorer. His name was Roald Amundsen. First explorer to reach the South Pole. And also he went to the North Pole less than 100 years ago. And on one of his trips to the North Pole, Amundsen took a homing pigeon with him. And when he got to the North Pole, he released the homing pigeon. Of course, Norway isn't very far from the North Pole. And uh, the pigeon took off into the air and then disappeared from sight. And some days later, his wife came out of her home in Norway. And there was the pigeon circling their home. And she exclaimed, he's alive! He's alive! My husband is alive! 
in a very real, real way. When the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, that Jesus, whom these disciples had seen ascend and go back to his Father, could say, he's alive, he's alive, and more than that, he's back, he is now in us, sharing his life with us. And this continues to be the Spirit's work. You see, everything else in the Christian life derives from this, that his actual life is implanted within us and we become sharers of the life of Christ together. Previously, he had inhabited one body, but now he comes to create a new body. That is his church, and he indwells corporately those who are his people, and we become one with him. This is what Jesus had prayed for in, in John chapter 17. This was the night that he took the bread and said, this is my body, Eat this in remembrance of me, and took the wine, this is my blood, a symbol of my blood. Drink this, it's the blood of the new covenant. And that very night, in that room, he had also talked to them at length. You can read it in John 14, 15, and 16. And then he prayed for them in John 17, a very wonderful prayer. But part of his prayer was this, in John 17, verse 11. He said, Holy Father... Protect them by the power of your name, the name that you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. That these will be one as, Father, you and I are one. Later in verse 20, he says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. By the way, that's you and me. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. The repeated theme of that prayer is this, that they may be one, Father, as you and I are one, that they may be one. Now, let me tell you what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that we'll be one in agreement, one in mind. It's wonderful when we are, but it's actually a pipe dream to assume that that's going to happen in any major sense. That's not what he's talking about there. But that we might know the oneness with Christ that he enjoyed with his Father. Now what is the oneness that Jesus had with his Father? He's not talking here about oneness of his deity, although of course he and the Father were co-equally with the Holy Spirit, God, and therefore there's a oneness of deity. But that oneness of deity Jesus enjoyed with his Father is not a oneness that we will enjoy with Christ. We will never be divine. It's not a oneness of his deity, it's a oneness of his activity. As Jesus said, I've shown you many great miracles from the Father. In other words, what you have seen in my activity, my miracles, is the Father's activity. He is working in me and through me. That's why back in John 14, also in the upper room, he said to his disciples, don't you believe I am in the Father, the Father's in me? The words I say to you are not just my own, rather it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. He says, my words are not my words. The words you hear from my lips are the words of my Father. The works you see through my life are not mine. They are the works of my Father living in me, doing his work. Which is why he then says in the next verse, believe me when I say I'm in the Father and the Father's in me, or at least believe me on the evidence of the miracles themselves. In other words, the miracles that you see are a demonstration of the fact that the Father is at work in me and through me. And in my activity, you see the activity of the Father, for Jesus had said in John 5, 19, I tell you the truth, he said, the Son can do nothing by himself. Don't congratulate me, Jesus might have said, on the miracles I perform, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. So what you see me do is actually what the Father is doing, as the Father lives in me and does his work. Now this is the oneness that Jesus enjoyed with his Father, and it's the oneness he prayed his disciples would enjoy with him. That I might be in them and they in me. And the result is that the works you see in them 
Don't congratulate them for. It is me working in them as it's my father who's been working in me. And this is what happened at Pentecost. This prayer was fulfilled with Pentecost. And from then on, you'll find those disciples, the little we know about them in detail, are very different people. Because now the explanation for their activity is Christ by his Holy Spirit operating in them and through them. Previously, you could explain everything Peter did simply in terms of Peter. It's Peter. It's his personality. It's his impetuousness. It's his spontaneity. It's his uh, big mouth. All the things we know about Peter before this event. But after this event, the only explanation is this is God at work. Let me give you briefly some examples in chapter 3, after the healing of the cripple at the temple gate. You remember that he was asking for money, and Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, what I have I'll give you in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And the man jumped up and began to walk, and a crowd gathered because they knew him. He'd, he'd stood at the temple gate for years. And when the crowd gathered around, in Acts 3 and verse 12, Peter said this, Men of Israel... Why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? In other words, he says this. What are you so surprised about? I mean, I can think of a lot of reasons why they were surprised. This man had been a cripple for years and they'd seen him every day at the temple gate. Now he's one, running, jumping, bouncing around the place. But Peter said, don't look at us is if we, by our own power or our godliness, made this man walk. Don't congratulate me for this. When you write this down in a record of this event, please don't call the book the Acts of the Apostles. This is not an act of an apostle. I didn't do this. Peter denies it. And then he says this, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus. This is not something that I have done. This is something which God is doing. You see, now Peter has been brought into union with God. And the activity of Peter's life can only be explained in terms of the activity of God in him and through him. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and others with him were brought before the Sanhedrin council. This was the highest Jewish authority. They had been the ones responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus a few weeks before. They hadn't the authority to sentence him to death. That's why they had to go to the Roman governor who alone could sanction his death sentence but they had recommended his death sentence. And now before the same group of people, Peter and John have been called, and Peter gave an explanation to them of what was going on. And it says, verse 13 of chapter 4, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now, of course, the Sanhedrin Council knew these men because Jesus and his band had been on their watched list for weeks. But this time, it says they were amazed. They said these men are unschooled. They are ignorant. They have never been anywhere. They're ordinary people. But they took note they're being with Jesus. And they almost got it right, but not quite. You see, what they assumed was this. They had been hanging around Jesus long enough for something to rub off at last. But that isn't true. Spiritual life never rubs off from somebody else. Never. Not even from Jesus. When they said they were amazed and they took note these men had been with Jesus, what the truth was that what they saw in these men that reminded them of Jesus was actually Jesus himself in them, working in them, giving them the courage they never had before. It was not his influence, it was his life in them that they saw. When Paul went on his missionary journeys, he came back to Antioch, the church which had commissioned him in Acts 14 and verse 22. Sorry, verse 27. And it says, on arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them, how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. When Paul got back, he said, I want to tell you, not what we have done for God, because that won't amount to very much. But what I will tell you is what God has done through us. That's exciting. That'll amount to something. How he, God, has opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And this, of course, is what makes the Christian life so relaxing. 
It's not about what you do for God. It's about what you allow God to do through you. As the source of our strength and our energy and our power, that doesn't mean we become zombies or we go into some neutral stance and controlled like a puppet on a string. No, of course it doesn't. But it means our dependency. As we seek to obey what God gives us to do in our dependency on him, Christ works. Now we have different personalities and we always will. And that's right, that's good. That's one of the wonderful things about being human. None of us are the same. We have different strengths. We have different weaknesses, different gifts, different lack of gifts. But the point is this, as we present all that we are and say, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, take charge in my life, the explanation for our lives becomes God and not us. And if we can explain ourselves simply in terms of our personalities and our abilities it won't amount to very much in the long run there has to be that which is inexplicable apart from the fact that God is at work and alive within us and through us now it's interesting that when Luke describes this he describes it this way, all of them were filled, he says, with the Holy Spirit. Now the word filled is an interesting word in this context. It's a word that Luke uses quite often in the book of Acts in a variety of contexts. Now we tend to use the word filled in terms of uh, topping up. This glass isn't quite full. And if I were to get a jug and say, would you please fill this, or ask, would you please fill this up, it means you'd top it up. And we sometimes tend to think of the Holy Spirit in those kind of terms, you know, like a liquid needing topping up. You know, the gas in your car needs filling, and so you sort of pour something more in. But of course, the Holy Spirit is not like a liquid. He is a person, the scripture makes very clear. You can't have more of him or less of him. He's a person. We can't have more or less of you here this morning. You're either here or you're not here. Of course, I can have more or less of your attention, but not more or less of you. And uh, the Spirit is either within us or he is not. So what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Luke uses the word nine times in the book of Acts in relation to the Holy Spirit, either about being filled with the Spirit or about being full of the Spirit. The difference is that when he speaks of being filled with the Spirit, he normally is referring to an event such as this. They woke up that morning without the Holy Spirit, went to bed that night filled with the Holy Spirit. It was an event that took place. When he speaks of people being full of the Spirit, he's normally speaking of a an ongoing condition every day. But he uses this word filled not just regarding the Holy Spirit, he also uses this word in relation to other things. For instance, in Acts 2, verse 43, he says about the residents of Jerusalem, everyone was filled with awe. What does it mean they were filled with awe? They were amazed, you see, what was happening there. In Acts 3 and verse 10, when the people gathered around, the man who had been healed at the temple gate in Jerusalem, it says they were filled with wonder and amazement. What does it mean to be filled with wonder and to be filled with amazement? In chapter 5 and verse 12, it speaks about the Sadducees who won the religious bodies in Jerusalem and they saw the crowds that the apostles were drawing and it says the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. What does it mean to be filled with jealousy? In... Uh, Acts 13 verse 45, again it says the Jews were filled with jealousy, the King James says filled with envy. In Acts 13 verse 52 it says the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with joy? The point is this is a very common word in Luke's writing. Now what does it mean to be filled with wonder, to be filled with amazement, to be filled with joy, to be filled with awe, to be filled with jealousy? doesn't mean somebody stands up and says, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to know, I have just been filled with wonder. I am full of it. And you say, oh, he's filled with wonder. He just said so. Oh, I did not note that down. Or some Christians get up and say, we have been filled with joy. 
What does it mean to be filled with wonder, amazement, joy, jealousy, envy? If we understand this, we may understand what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I suggest to you this, what it means to be filled with wonder, amazement, jealousy, envy, etc. Is that these emotions primarily, in that instance, dominated their personalities and determined their behavior. The wonder, amazement, dominated their personalities and determined their behavior. So when Luke the historian records what happens in Jerusalem when the man is here to the temple gate and he says they were filled with wonder and amazement, what he means was this, their eyes were the size of saucers. And they were saying, wow! And they were jumping six feet off the ground and he was saying, they are filled with wonder and amazement. Look at them. It dominates their personality, it determines their behavior. What does it mean when he says the Jews were filled with jealousy or filled with envy? It means they were saying that something here is going on that is threatening us and threatening our position in this community and we've got to stop it. And he says the way they acted, the way they behaved, the way they were bent on, on destroying the work that God was doing with these apostles, he says they were filled with, en with, with envy and with jealousy because jealousy dominated their personality and determine their behavior. What does it mean when he says the disciples were filled with joy? It means that when they met together there in Acts chapter 13, there was such a buoyancy, he could see it all across their faces, and he said they're filled with joy. It dominates their personality, it determines their behavior. What do you think it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I suggest you this, it means that the Holy Spirit dominates our personality and determines our behavior. That the way we live and behave and act and react is determined by the Holy Spirit's fullness. He dominates our personality. He determines our behavior. I find it very interesting that the first explanation given about all this by the crowds in Jerusalem is in Acts 2 and verse 13 when they said, these men have had too much wine. They are drunk. In fact, that was such a strong explanation that circulated that when Peter got to preach the first thing he said in verse 14 was these men are not drunk as you suppose it is only nine o'clock in the morning the bars aren't open yet they're not drunk but I find it interesting that they associated these men with being drunk and also interesting that on the only occasion Paul uses the phrase to be filled with the Holy Spirit is in Acts uh, sorry it's in Ephesians 5 and verse 18 he says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now he says, don't get drunk. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And he seems there to associate being drunk or uses being drunk as an illustration of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you know a person is drunk? Do you know a person is drunk because they give you a testimony? They stand up and say, ladies and gentlemen, I am drunk. I really, really am drunk. Hope you believe me. No, no one ever usually says that. Do you know how a person's drunk? It's very simple. They have enough intoxicating liquor to dominate their personality and determine their behavior. Enough intoxicating liquor to dominate their personality and determine their behavior. How do you know a man is drunk? Because the way he drives his car. By the way, he walks down the white line in the middle of the road. On the freeway. <laughs> you say he's drunk I studied in Glasgow for three years and I lived right in the center of the city in the downtown area just up from the central station and Glasgow at that stage had the reputation of having the highest uh, levels of alcoholism of any city in Europe I believe that that honor has moved elsewhere now but in those days that was the reputation that Glasgow had and coming out of the residence that I was in, walking down that main street, especially in the evening, you would almost always see somebody who was the worst for drink. I met a lot of folks who were drunk, never because anybody ever told me or ever acknowledged that they were drunk. But I knew they were drunk for certain reasons. The first reason was usually the way they walked. They would sort of stagger down the street like this and, and, and hit the shop window and bounce back the lamppost and bounce back the other way. And as they meandered down the sidewalk, I'd say to myself, uh oh, I think they're drunk. 
Then as you got closer, he might hold onto a lamppost. And as you came by, he, he would say, excuse me, could you give me 50 pence? I haven't had a cup of tea f f f for a week. <laughs> and he could tell he was drunk by the way he talked. Now, it was always bad policy to give somebody money like that. If you want to give him a cup of tea, take him to a cafe or make him one somewhere, and that isn't what he wanted, of course. He wanted something stronger. So he might leave his lamppost and sort of lurch across, grab you by the arm, hold on to you tight, breathe into your face and say, but I haven't had a cup of tea for a week. And as he breathed into your face, you felt your own knees begin to go weak. <laughs> and you knew he was drunk by the way he smelled. He would stink of the stuff. Now, three giveaway evidences a man is drunk. The way he walks, the way he talks, and the way he smells. Now, how do you know when a man or a woman is filled with the Holy Spirit? Let me give you three giveaway evidences. The way they walk, the way they talk, and the way they smell. Now, before you start claiming spirituality for the person sitting next to you, <laughs> let me explain what I mean. First of all, by the way you walk, that is, by the way you move through life. Galatians 5 verse 16 says, walk in the Spirit. The New International Version says, live in the Spirit, though the better rendering, in fact, the, the word that is actually wrongly translated, there is the word walk. Walk in the Spirit. That is, as you go through life, it is the Spirit who is determining how you live and act and behave. Ephesians 5 verse 2 says, walk in love. And of course, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of love. The fruitless spirit is love. And as you walk through life, there'll be a love that comes through. That doesn't mean sentiment, by the way. Because love can be tough and has to be. And love is truthful and love is honest. And you walk in love. 1 John 1 says, walk in the light. That is, there's an openness. And as you walk through life, as you move through life, there are things that characterize you that can only be explained in terms of the Spirit. The second evidence is the way we talk. And you know, Jesus gave a very accurate barometer of the human heart in Matthew 12 and verse 34. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you want to know what's going on in somebody's heart, just... Stay around and listen to what comes out of their mouth, especially when they're off guard, if they're ever on guard. Because what happens in the heart is going to find its way out through the mouth. That's why in all ten references after Pentecost to people being filled with the Spirit or full of the Spirit, when that phrase is used, in every one of them something happens to the person's mouth. Here on the day of Pentecost, they all spoke in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them in such a way that those from 17 nationalities listed as being in Jerusalem heard in their own language the wonderful works of God. When Paul said, be filled with the Spirit, in Ephesians 5.18, his next word is, speak to one another, sing and make music in your heart to God, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He says, when you're filled with the Spirit, you'll begin to speak and you'll sing. You'll have something to sing about. That's why when we meet together like this, we sing. And by the way, if you have a problem singing praises to God, there's probably something wrong with your heart. Could be there's something wrong with your voice, of course, and your wife tells you to shut up. <laughs> but if you find there's no joy that needs to come out in song, something happens to the mouth. But not only is it the way we walk and the way we talk, but the way we smell. Now you say, you must be exaggerating this. Well, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and let me just read you what Paul wrote here. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. He says, Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance, notice this, the fragrance of the knowledge of him. 
For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death and to the other the fragrance of life. Now he says, God spreads through us the fragrance of Christ. If I can put it crudely, he says, we smell of Christ. What does that mean? It means this, that the atmosphere of our lives points to Christ. And to some it is the smell of life and it draws them. To some it's the smell of death. That's why when you live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, people are going to fight you. It's the smell of death. Or it's the smell of life and people are going to gravitate. Because they say, here's the source of life. So it's a very wonderful thing when you meet somebody who you don't know is a Christian and you just sense that they are a total stranger. And I'm sure you've had that experience, as I have on a number of occasions. Remember a number of years ago, I was in South India and I was taking a train from Bangalore down to the southern tip, Kerala, where I was to speak at a conference. And I went third class. Somebody told me it was a way to see real India. And when I realized how cheap it was, I thought, great, I'll go third class. It was a 20-hour journey. When I got on the train, I realized why it was so cheap. The train was jam-packed. And looking around the, uh, the compartment that I was in, there was, a, there was a sea of faces and they were all curious about me because most visitors to the country tended to be traveling first class, I guess. And as I looked at my fellow travelers, there was one guy sitting opposite me, slightly opposite, just to the side, and his face was different to everybody else's, but I couldn't tell you what it was. He was the same shape as everybody else. He was dressed in the same clothes as everybody else. His color was the same as everybody else. The only thing I can suggest is that when you looked into his eyes, it looked as though somebody was at home. And there was life. And in the course of our journey, it was 20 hours, I got in a conversation with him at one point and I said, do you mind if I ask you a question? I said, are you a Christian? I thought, if he is, it'll be great. We can enjoy some fellowship together. If he's not, well, we can talk about it. I said, are you a Christian? And his face lit up even more, and he said, yes, I am. And it just so happened that he had been in Bangalore to assist in the translation of a portion of Scripture into a small tribal area in the Nilgri Hills of which he was a part, and he was helping them with the grammar and the... Uh, perfecting of this translation. But it was a very wonderful experience, just looking into a sea of faces and seeing someone in whom there was something that was different. It was the aroma of Christ. My only disappointment with that experience was that when I told him that I was a Christian, he was surprised. <laughs> so it, uh, it didn't work both ways, I'm afraid. But you see, there is this aroma of Christ. Somebody said to me this morning at the first service, if I can quote them, they'd never been here before. And he came down to talk to me. And uh, he said, I've never been here before. I've watched Living Truth on television a few times. And I, I've driven up this morning because uh, uh, I had time on my hands. And I decided to come this morning. And I said, have you had a good morning? He said, you know, God is here. God is here, he said to me. And you see, God is here because there's a corporate group of men and women who said, Lord, we've come to the end of ourselves. We've come to the end of any sense of our own adequacy and our own ability. And we throw ourselves in complete dependence on you. God, you take charge and you work. He does. Now, you don't see that in yourself. We're to live in dependence on God and obedience to God and the road is tough and there's a battle all the way. We're told that we are in spiritual warfare. Scripture is very clear about that. You go, go to bed at night and you feel weary and you feel, well, I've not done everything today and I've failed again today. You'll feel that way. 
I have no time for spiritual introspection. Don't look inside to see how you're doing. Never try to look into some kind of spiritual mirror and say, am, am I like Christ today? Oh boy, I'm really Christ-like today. <laughs> You'll never see that. If you're like me and I work on the assumption most people are like me, that I'm normal and therefore most people are like me, every time you look inside yourself you find an old nature alive and well, hankering for good sin if you can get away with it and if nobody was watching. Don't you find that? Because we have an old nature, the flesh, that fights against the spirit, and the spirit fights against the flesh. And that battle, battle is a continuous one. And every day, I am lumbered with an old nature that's rotten through and through in the language of Paul in the Living Bible in Romans 7. And that's part of me too. Part of you too. And you're aware of the battle. And if I look inside, if I ever get introspective, I always get depressed. That's why the writer of the Hebrews says, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He's the author, he's the finisher. What he began, he's going to complete. That's where your trust lies. That's where your confidence lies. And say, Lord, with all my barrenness, with all my failure, with all my battles that rage within me, thank you for the Holy Spirit. I want him to fill my life. You don't feel anything different. I mean, sometimes you might, I guess, but that's entirely a subjective thing. The point is that it's your disposition of heart. Sometimes you move in and out of dependence on God and the working of the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes crises in our lives are often good for us because it's often the crises that drive us back in dependence on God. And when we depend on God, he works. And then things get easy again and we begin to relax and we become self-sufficient. And... Uh, we lose that sense of his presence and working in fullness. But these men and women, 120 of them in Jerusalem on this day, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, the first thing that happened is that they came into union with God. The Spirit brings into union with God. Father, as you and I are one, because I'm in you and you're in me, may they also be one, as they are in me and I am in them, that the world may know that you sent me, that the world will see something about these men and women's lives is inexplicable apart from the fact God is alive in them. You say, how does this work out? Well, that's what the rest of the book of Acts is about. And of course, at this rate, it'll take us 10 years to go through the book of Acts, so we won't be able to stay at this rate. But in the course of time, we'll go back to sections of the Acts, and we'll simply see how this works out, because that's what the book of Acts is about. It is the acts of the Holy Spirit in the apostles, doing the work of Jesus, through the apostles. But it may be this morning you don't know him at all. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never come into a relationship with with God. You've never realized even that it is possible to come into such a relationship. You may have heard that you can be forgiven. That's a wonderful thing. But it's so much more than that. That you may know the indwelling presence and fullness of the Holy Spirit working in you. So that back in your place of work tomorrow, back in your office, your business, your school, your home. There may be things that carry no explanation other than God has been at work in you and through you, putting you in the right place at the right time for the right reasons with the right people, guiding your paths as he's promised to. You'll go home tomorrow night and say, I failed again. Sinlessness is not an option. That's not the issue. The issue is within all our failure. We say, Spirit of God, fill me with yourself. And he does. Is that your experience? Let's pray together. Lord God, we're so humbled and deeply, deeply grateful this morning 
that you came into this world not just to cleanse us from our sin and make us fit for heaven when we die. We're grateful for, the, for that. But you came to restore us to union with yourself. That you might live in us and we might be in you. And as we live in dependence on you and obedience to you, we might see you at work in our lives. We can't always measure what you're doing. But we want to walk by faith and not by sight and trust you that you are. And I pray this will be real for every person in this place here this morning. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.